Special good morning to all our listeners, viewers, and our distinguished panel, as well as our in-house audience to this Tourism Stakeholders Conversation here today at the National Stadium. Today, we are going to have open and frank discussions on the industry, COVID-19 in the context of tourism, vaccinations, and what we as a destination, Grenada, Cariacou, and PT Martinique, need to do to successfully revive the industry. I am Kul grant Hoshtialik, the acting CEO of the Grenada Tourism Authority and the Manager of Product Development and Research at, at the Authority. So, um, without further ado, um, we start the proceedings. We will start with the invocation, which will be delivered by Reverend Harold Andrews, who is also a poet, this, the president of the New Beginnings Recording Company, a songwriter, and, and he does his songs on social and spiritual issues. It is now indeed my pleasure to invite Reverend Harold Andrews to lead us in a word of prayer. Please stand. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O oh God, our creator, we thank you for yet another day that you have created and for allowing us to experience it. We thank you for the insight shown by the Ministry of Tourism, the Grenada Tourism Authority, and others in bringing together different sectors of the tourism industry to hold conversation on a range of issues connected to the tourism industry. COVID-19 is one issue that is negatively impacting the lives and livelihoods of those involved in the industry, resulting in tremendous hardship and suffering. We ask you, O oh Lord, to use your almighty power to stop the COVID-19 virus in its tracks, not only here in Grenada, but worldwide. Help us as well to take personal responsibility for maintaining an environment free of COVID-19 in our country <clears throat> by following the protocols and by getting vaccinated, thereby protecting ourselves, our loved ones, from serious illness and even death at the same time, contributing greatly to the revitalization of the tourism industry. So during this watershed moment, the Tourism Stakeholders Conversation, we invite your Holy Spirit to come and abide with us. We pray that your spirit of truth will give wisdom and guidance during the conversation that is about to take place so that at the end of the session, participants will feel a renewed sense of purpose, eager to implement whatever decisions arrive at under your guidance so that the tourism industry will be built back stronger and better to your glory and honor and to the great benefit of the people of this beautiful, beloved nation. This we humbly ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you so very much, Reverend Andrews. That was indeed not only sobering, inspiring, setting the right stage for us today, but thank you so very much for your words of wisdom. Some housekeeping matters. Our in-house studio audience today, I wish to remind you to please place your phone on silent or vibrate while you're with us. For those of you who wish to log on to the Zoom platform today, we ask that you please mute your audio and your microphone to ensure that we have no dis disruptions. And um, we also would like any questions, any questions from our in-house audience today. Um, we have a microphone set to your, to your left. Please, when you come to ask your questions, you state your name and the company for which you represent. We also have today presentations from, a uh, short presentation from the Ministry of Health. Um, who will be joining us shortly. Who's in the room? And um, I didn't see them sneak by on my, on my right. Um, and we will also have a presentation from TEDA, which is a new solution for, tr for tracking and tracing on the island. So he will be joining us via Zoom. 
Our feature speaker today is our Minister for Tourism, the Honorable Dr. Clarice Modes Kerwin. She is our champion for the industry and her passion for tourism, and its success, its success is evident in her profound involvement in the industry. Just two days ago, Minister, our minister, who is a medical doctor, was also on the forefront downstairs of this very building in the athletic stadium administering vaccines as she continues her advocacy for the rejuvenation of the tourism sector through and by doing, simply getting things done. We certainly all have to be leaders in the fight against COVID-19. Thank you so very much, Minister, for your leadership. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel for today. Mr. Barry Collimore, our chairman of the Grenada Tourism Authority. He's also the director and partner of the West Indies Management Company uh, for the recently launched West Indies School of Hospitality, for which I know many of you are quite thrilled and excited to start the 6,000 courses that are going to be available to us. Chairman Collimore is also a director of the Savvy Group of Port Louis Marina and for Mount Cinnamon. To his right is Mr. Leo Garbert, MBE, and he has over 30 years experience in the tourism industry. He's the president of the Grenada Hotel and Tourism Association, was awarded 2020 Caribbean Hotelier of the Year by CHTA, and is the proud owner of our, one of our most prestigious family-run luxury resorts on the island, Calabash Luxury Boutique Hotel. And joining him also on the panel, as I indicated before, we have our health representatives today. And they, are, of course, are going to be with us. Um, we'll provide some information for you with regard to COVID, um, the steps that we've been taking. So we have our chief medical officer, Dr. Sean Charles, and we also have um, Ms. Dr. Mayana Charles as well. So we, thank very, we, we look forward to our panel, who's going to who's going to be leading us through this exercise today. It is now my distinct pleasure to invite the Chairman of the Grenada Tourism Authority to make some brief remarks, Chairman Collimore. Thank you, thank you, Carl. Um, Minister of Tourism, Honorable Clarice Modest Kerwin, uh, President of the um, Grenada Hotel and Tourism Association, Mr. Leo Garbutt, um, Dr. Charles, Sean Charles, CMO, and Dr. Mayana Charles. Um, Dr. Mayana, what's your, um, sorry, Mayana, is it Charles? Yeah. yeah, right, okay. Not related? No. Okay. <laughs> um, former Minister of Tourism, uh, Honorable uh, Brenda Hood, and we, uh, as well as we have the CEO of the GHTA, um, Ms. Arlene Friday, and all of our specially invited guests, and to those of you on Zoom and, and, uh, and Facebook and other platforms. I'm, I'll be very brief, and just to say that the aim of this uh, session here really is to hear uh, from the tourism stakeholders to answer your questions. Um, these last uh, 12 months, 12 to 18 months or so, have been months of uh, great uncertainty. And there are many questions, I know. And uh, we've been working hard at the Grenada Tourism um, Authority uh, with the board and, and uh, very closely with uh, Minister Modest, who, who uh, said to us a, a few weeks ago, guys, we have to get... Uh, back to the stakeholders and we have to have an accountable and informative and a, and a really deep information sharing uh, session with them. She told all of us to clear our schedules and no matter drop everything that you're doing and we come sit listen to whatever questions um, the, the stakeholders may have and, um, and uh, try to provide uh, insight and, uh, and ideas, and, and I look at this as, as not just a presentation, but uh, a sharing of ideas and information with, with the stakeholders. So I'm very happy about this, and um, I'll be pleased to uh, answer any questions, have comments, etc., that you may have, but the forum really is to hear from 
um, the stakeholders more than more than anything else. So um, thank you, Carl, and um, I will uh, sit back down and and uh, if an, anyone has any questions uh, for me in terms of, uh, I'm sure I will be able to uh, answer them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so very much, um, Chairman Collymore. Um, so without any further ado, because uh, we know that we would have started the program a little bit late, I now invite our Minister for Tourism to deliver her remarks. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, and good morning to all. I want to recognize the members here at the head table. Um, let me start with health. Um, our um, chief medical officer, CMO, Dr. Sean Charles, and his assistant, Dr. Mayana Charles. Um, our chairman of the board of GTA, and of course, president of the board of GHTA, um, Ms. Arlene Friday, CEO of GHTA, Sister Brenda Hood, and um, Mrs. Curl, Hosty Alec Chairperson of today's activities. And to everyone gathered here, good morning. And to all of those on the various platforms that are listening in, uh, good morning. I am sure and uh, um, that you will have opportunity to make your comments, questions, whether you're here physically or whether you virtually somewhere else. <clears throat> um, we couldn't do this without having the healthcare persons with us. We all know what has happened with COVID-19. And as um, before I really go into the few comments I want to make, I just want to ask that we pause very briefly for our, the brothers and sisters in our neighboring island, Trinidad and Tobago. I saw the statistics this morning, very heartrending and um, very concerning. And uh, let's just take a couple of seconds to, to ponder on that and to, to pay respects to those who have died. Okay, thank you. So I will not go into what has happened with COVID globally. I think we all know, and I expect we, we're following. And um, I will not, so I will not detail on it. And what is happening regionally? And except to say that I want to commend the Ministry of Health, the Minister, his CMO, and his team for the initiatives they've taken um, thus far to keep Grenada as safe as possible from COVID and to um, minimize deaths. I think up till now, it's, we're still at one. Um, our sister island, Trinidad, I think they're heading for 60 deaths, um, somewhere thereabouts. And uh, the, the unceasing work that they would have done over the period of time. And of course, um, I think it's only fair that I say that the government of Grenada has put its efforts, its money, where its mouth is, to protect the lives of our citizens and to bring back livelihoods. <coughs> and therefore, I just want to say that from February to now, government, uh, the Ministry of Health has brought in about 50,000 vaccines. We have used under 25. Um, <coughs> the batch that the last said that they have would expire on the 27th of June. Um, it means we're, we have a catching up to do. We also got our vaccines before a lot of other countries who have fast-tracked and gone ahead of us and have vaccinated many more. We have been moved from green to amber, and I think we all know why. The main issue is the number of persons that we have vaccinated in our country. That's the main reason. We've kept our numbers down. We have done pretty well. We have had some... <clears throat> um, acts, acts of complacency, not wearing the mask, not social distancing, washing the hands, etc. Um, but we have done well. Now we, we have come to the sticking point. We have not had enough persons vaccine, not anywhere near. And I will leave the details to our 
active physicians to, to, to tell about that, but we are in a place of concern. We're talking tourism, we're talking bringing people back. The cruise ships are calling their um, the crew back. I know yesterday I visited somebody and she said, I said, where's her son? And I asked for her son. And she said, he's gone back because they're doing dry runs, they're doing simulations, they're getting people ready. Um, they, they, they're getting ready to go global, but they're getting ready to come to the Caribbean. What do we as persons in the cruise industry, what are we doing, where are we in terms of our readiness to have that happen? We, we were even approached by them to vaccinate, to, as, as a matter of fact, we offered to assist in ensuring that we have that we provide the access for our locals um, who are seafarers to be vaccinated. And we have been offering that, and they know we've said it publicly, they're welcome to come and get vaccinated. Um, they even asked us to go further. I guess they heard that we have some excess um, and to assist in vaccinating other Caribbean islands. But we know what we have to do, our first priority is, of course, vaccinating our people here. And I wish before the, the time expires for the vaccine that we would have used all of the 50. If not, we'll have to look at what else uh, we can do. So my dear brothers and sisters, we, we're here to have the truth, the authentic information about the vaccine. And subsequently, we'll be discussing based on, on, on the knowledge, on, on what we would have gotten. Where are we and where are we going and how can we get there and how can we all play our role? Um, Dr. Mayana Charles is here. She's anxious to go downstairs to assist with the vaccination process and they have both consented to give us some time. So we will dedicate the first segment, whatever it is, 45 minutes, one hour, and Dr. Charles has some World Bank meeting and he's pushed everything back so that he can be here, so that persons can make informed decisions. I just want to end by saying, and I'm an old masquerader, and I play the mask that plays with powder. And there's an old saying, you cannot play mask and fruit powder. It just does not work. It will not work. In other, last night, we had a consultation in St. Mark, and one of the, the, the attendees there spoke about having lost, and my close friend, two siblings within a week of each other. And then her daughter had COVID, recovered, and shortly afterwards had a stroke, had a blood clot, had no vaccine, and you will find that there are a number of cases. I have a nephew. He had COVID. His wife had COVID. He subsequently, he got better. He had a heart attack. She was not, and he recovered. She was not so lucky. She had a, a clot going into the lung, and that was the end of it. Do we have to wait to see our beds filled? Do we have to wait to see us turning back people because we have limited capacity? Do we want to wait until all of the other sister islands get ahead of us and get the act together and get the tourism industry going while we flounder here? Brothers and sisters, the choice is ours. It's, for me, it was an easy choice. I had my first vaccine. I, 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 I should have had my second one a little while ago, but I, I chose to do it today in my constituency. And, um, but make the wise choice. Ask your questions. Be open-minded. I, I used to take a, vaccine, a, a medication for my stomach, and I took it for a number of years. And, um, and then I heard it was pulled out of the market. I didn't sit down and beat myself up because I took it. Why, you know, I didn't ask myself, why did you take it? You should have waited until they tell you that you know, it has that side effect. Medication doesn't work like that, that you wait until you see long-term effect. When you see the long-term effect, people are already dead. That is the reality. We know that short-term, the vaccine works, it saves life, it prevents transmissions. Let us make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Well said, straight to the point. I don't think 
I think that everything um, has been said in terms of what we need to do um, and stimulating and encouraging us to get on that, on that path, the path of ensuring that we all get vaccinated and the faster we're able to revitalize the tourism industry. So we all have our part to play. As I say, it, tourism connects us all. We got to really not only believe that, um, but practice that as well. Now, without any further ado, um, I would like to invite the esteemed health officials who are here with us today, the Chief Medical Officer and Dr. Mayana Charles, um, to do their presentation, uh, to deliver their remarks to you today. I'm unsure if, they, if they're going to come to the podium or if they're going to stay where they are. Podium. Okay. Please welcome them. Esteemed members of the panel, um, friends, colleagues, in the viewing and, and listening audience. Um, we at the Ministry of Health, we are happy to be here to further contribute to the discussion um, surrounding uh, vaccination, reopening, resumption of, of uh, tourism activities um, in, a, in a nutshell uh, our path to returning to normal. Uh, we at the health in the in the Ministry of Health we have been you know battling um, the COVID pandemic for quite some time and, and the results are clear I think by now to everyone but we do know that we still have a long way to go. This pandemic is far from over. Um, we know what we are witnessing even in neighboring countries and um, it's quite concerning because um, at the end of the day, it's, we live in a global village and especially um, the tourism industry in particular brings us very close together because it involves persons um, traveling from country to country. So we know that we live in this global village. We share the same risks as every other member of this global village. And we can have the same um, outcomes as everyone, else, um, as, as everyone else in this village. So we have to be aware and we have to be prepared. The COVID-19 um, pandemic has really changed the world. It has been it has, what has happened since its um, emergence has been unimaginable. The world is a different place. Right now, it is a priority of every country to ensure that the citizens are vaccinated and protected. All right, it is a priority of every country to ensure that the citizens are vaccinated and that they are protected. All right, so Grenada is not the exception. This discussion that we are having right now is happening right across the world. All right, there are always persons who are for, persons who are against, but the evidence of the benefits and the effectiveness of vaccination is becoming more evident every day. We are seeing in countries where vaccination have been, um, campaigns have been successful, we are seeing dramatic decreases in deaths, even though there are ongoing, there is ongoing infection, we're seeing decrease, decreases in the number of deaths. But we are seeing decreases in the number of cases as well. All right? Both are observed in countries that have very effective um, vaccination campaigns and they have achieved uh, an acceptable level of coverage in the population. As a result, we are witnessing the relaxation of restrictions in a stepwise manner. 
the restrictions that were there in the past to help control this pandemic are now being eased. Even yesterday, we witnessed another update by the CDC that persons who are fully vaccinated, all right, it is now safe for them to be indoors and outdoors without a mask. All right? We saw countries like Israel that allow now events, even mass gathering events, because they've achieved high levels of vaccination coverage in their population. So we're seeing an increase in you know, ordinary personal freedoms that we used to take for granted even before the, the COVID pandemic. All right? It is creating confidence in the public as well that they are on a path to getting back to normal. All right? That stepping out of your house and going to school or stepping into a public, onto public transportation or going to work, you know, isn't a risk of life and death. All right? Because persons are vaccinated and they're protected. So it's contributing to the mental well-being of the populations. Once a person is vaccinated, they feel more confident. They feel like I can take on the world. Um, I have one less thing to worry um, too much about. And of course, it's increasing economic activity because as more persons in the population are vaccinated, more restrictions are lifted, then we have businesses starting to get back to normal. And of course, it means an increase in travel. Persons are hungry to travel right now. They have been cooped up in their homes for more than a year. Right? I know that there are projections for tourism and all that by persons who understand the industry better than, than, than I do. But there is also an anxiety among persons who want to travel. All right? But they want to be safe as well. All right? So they will be looking at where they're traveling, and they will be picking those destinations that are deemed to be safe. All right? And there are different factors that determine you know, whether a destination is safe. And I'm sure vaccination coverage, level of vaccination coverage, is going to be one of them. Because no one wants to be caught um, vacationing in a, in a place where suddenly there's a massive outbreak and there's sudden imposition of restrictions and whatever in order to control it, and they, get, they and their family get you know, caught up in the mix and they get trapped. So it will breed anxiety in the minds of, of these um, individuals as well. And it will factor into the, the, the consideration whether they choose um, our destination or another. Of course, there are other factors. Vaccines, of course, the vaccine that we have on offer here is the one that was developed by the University of Oxford and um, manufactured, marketed by the drug maker AstraZeneca. Um, it's a proven safe and effective vaccine. It's one of the first to receive WHO emergency use listing. It's one of the most scrutinized vaccines. All right? Millions of doses, it is the vaccine that formed the basis of the vaccination cam campaign in the UK. All right, so they were using it long before it appeared on our shores, before, before we had access to it. All right, like I say, it, was one of, it is one of the most scrutinized vaccines. All right, the adverse effects or the side effects or whichever um, following this vaccine are well established and are well documented. The common adverse effects are mild. They usually, persons may get a fever, all right, some chills, um, some little aches and pains, maybe pain or so at the injection sites. These are the more common um, reactions. And of course, in very rare cases, right, in very rare cases, you know, I have to say in very rare cases because sometimes things are magnified in the media, all right? It's as if, I don't know, you, 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 you walk across this very beautiful football field and you, and you pick up one slither of plastic and then 
you zoom in onto that, onto that plastic and you post a big headline, the stadium is a garbage dump. But when you zoom out, you realize it's one slither of plastic, one slither. That might have just flown across in the wind. So things are sometimes magnified. And of course, because they're serious, all right? So in very rare instances, all right, a particular type of blood clot was seen. Um, two cases, one case in, in 200,000, 250,000 persons um, following vaccination. And of course, it is a cause for concern. All right? It has not been directly linked to the vaccine, but it was seen following vaccination. So it's, it's one of those things that we have to look at. But it does not mean that the vaccine is unsafe. All right? It is one observation that proves that the system for monitor, monitoring after vaccination works. But persons must also be aware that in Grenada, on, any, on a normal basis, that is without vaccination or anything, every year we admit upwards of 50 persons at General Hospital, and this is General Hospital only. We admit upwards of 50 persons every year for blood clots. This has nothing to do with vaccination. This is, this is normal population levels. In 2016, we had 56 admissions to treat blood clots. We call it DVT, or deep vein thrombosis. In 2017, we had 53. All right, it's long before the vaccine. Uh, it, it did not create an uproar then. But in addition, there's a most serious location for blood clots, which are blood clots in the lungs. Every year, we, ad we, we admit more than 25 persons for blood clots in the lungs at the General Hospital. And this has nothing to do with vaccination. In 2016, we had 30 such cases. In 2017, we had 26. But I can guarantee you now that anyone who takes the vaccine today and develops a clot, the vaccine is going to be blamed. Um, we are going to forget all of the background levels of occurrence of the disease, and we're going to, because it's, some, it's, it's, it, it's a play on the mind, all right? So I want persons to, to think rationally and look at all of the benefits. All right, these vaccines have been proven safe and effective. They prevent severe disease, they prevent hospitalization, prevent deaths. So another benefit is avoiding unnecessary deaths in the population. How many persons would have been saved from the over three million who have died? How many would have been saved if they were vaccinating? We could only, we could only spec speculate. We want to get back to normal, and this is a path to getting back to normal. It is proven. Look at the countries with very good vaccination coverage, very good vaccination uptake, and look at, and look at how um, they are, you know, their citizens are returning slowly to normal activity. So our children can return to school, all right? And we can avoid all of the, you know, the emotional trauma that they will suffer for, for some time to come, all right? If we are able to achieve this and get back to normal, Yes, our hotel workers can, you know, get back to work because as people, as persons become more, more comfortable with traveling, your industry will benefit. The ordinary worker, they'll, they'll, they'll get back to, to working and get back to their earnings. The cruise workers, as Minister said, all right, the cruise industry, big beneficiary, there is no resumption of cruise industry without vaccination. There is zero. It is, it is a non-negotiable thing. All right? And the only way you would have a safe cruise industry is when you have persons are vaccinated. Because we know what we witnessed at the start of this outbreak. The university. The only safe way that you can have 
lecture halls filled with students is if they're all vaccinated. Um, that is without question. You can't have mass gatherings of people with zero protection against a disease congregating together. It's a recipe for, for disaster. So, I mean, there is no question that that is the only way that can happen. And all of the activities that are so supported by the university committee, com community, all of the support services, all of the business that is generated as a result of that can only happen if we are at an acceptable level of coverage and, and, and immunity. All right? So, I mean, there are many, many benefits. I think in my few remarks, I think I, I, I try to cover um, as many of them as possible. But of course, for us here, we know that time is running out. Every, all of the COVID vaccines have a lifespan of about six months. So from the time, from production, all right, from production to expiry, it's six months. Unfortunately, we, uh, we live very far away from the manufacturing sites. So it takes about three months between, you know, packaging and shipping before it lands here. So when it lands in Grenada, we have about three months to use them or they go. And that date for us is the 27th of June. All right, we have, we have quite a number of doses left that if we are unable to administer them before this date, that's it. And I cannot, I cannot we do not have a date when we'll get more. So if persons are still on the fence, um, sometimes if we wait, that decision may be made for you to your detriment, all right? That day may come when you come to the realization that, listen, I really need this vaccine because X, Y, Z. And that day might be too late because it may not be available. It's extremely difficult to get our hands on vaccines right now. It's extremely difficult. Um, there are countries who have not received a dose and they're clamoring for it. And then there are countries like us who have, you know, substantial number and yet we, we are hesitant. All right, we hope that this would improve. All right, we hope that this will improve as time goes on. Um, the Ministry of Health continues to encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Um, because what you, you're not just doing it for yourself, you're doing it for your family and you're doing it for your country. Uh, get protected so that we can all get back to normal. We need to all work together. And that is the only way we're gonna get out of this. We can't have some, some really trying to push forward while others are seriously pulling us back. At the end of the day, you go nowhere. All right, when those two forces are, when you do the math, you end up staying in the same place. So we, en we encourage everyone to get vaccinated. We also encourage everyone to obey the public health measures so that we prevent exposure or potential exposure. And those public health measures include wearing of masks, sanitizing, distancing. All right, they work at preventing exposure or potential exposure to infectious agents. All right, so we encourage everyone to do that. So that's my message here today. All right, the benefits of vaccination is evident. We need to work together, and that's the only way we'll get this done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles. That was hitting the nail right on the head and asking us the very important question. How do we make Grenada safe? And he certainly told us in the steps that we should be considering in order to make Grenada safe. Um, as we get ready to open the floor for discussion and for your questions, um, our health team, as our minister would have indicated earlier in her address, 
the, we have vaccines happening downstairs and our, our chief medical officer, of course, has another engagement that he has postponed understanding the significance, the very significance of this conversation this morning. So I open the floor for your discussions, um, for your questions. Um, the panel is here and we, we are here to answer those questions. Do we have any questions online in, in the house? Yes, we have, two, we have two questions in house. So we will start with those. Uh, Yes, please. The first question, the gentleman to the back. Please, re please identify yourself and your company you represent. And then go straight into your question. Thank you. Yeah, um, good morning. Um, I'm Peter Morin, representing Mystic Tools. Two, two small questions. Um, the doctor, as the doctor had explained that there's an expiry date in the vaccine. So, so, so in a matter of one month time, approximately. So if someone taking the first shot now, what guarantee would you have for them to get the other shot? Because it, there's a space time of, of approximately eight weeks or so. Second question is, I think probably the, 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 the government should, because it's about 25% of the population that took the vaccine already. And I think most of that 25% are people close in the tourism industry. So why the government don't probably go out to the, to, to the, to the different community and, and, and do a sort of a campaign similar to what they will do for election, advertising the, the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Charles. As it relates to the time for the second shot, now, when the vaccine was developed and when it was studied, the manufacturers recommended that you get your second dose four to 12 weeks after, right? So persons can get it second dose as early as four weeks. Now, uh, ongoing evidence has showed that the longer duration between the two shots increases the effectiveness of the vaccine, right? Now, but the degree of increasing the effectiveness is not as great. So persons who take their first shot today can get their second shot in a matter of one month, as little as one month. With regards to the second question, the advice that you gave with regards to using a sort of election type campaign, uh, I mean, we would welcome it. I mean, I'm speaking from a Ministry of Health um, um, point of view, but we have, been, we have been making efforts to go out into different communities, <coughs> sorry, going out into different communities and vaccinating all right, we have had outreach in many communities, um, trying to bring vaccination as close as possible to the individual. It is a work in progress, and of course, it can always be improved um, with um, suggestions like these. So we, would, we, we have no um, objections to having you know, this type of campaign that you mentioned. in our in-house audience. Please take the mic. Good morning all. My name is Patrick Braffitt. I'm here representing MEAG, but the questions I ask aren't really from MEAG. They're personal. Um, regarding the possibility of only timing allowed for a single dose, would a single dose not be preferable to no dose? Or must you have both doses? Yes. Some protection, as we say, is better than no protection at all. So if you look at the strategy that was employed by the UK, they were, given only, they were giving only the first dose when they just started because they wanted to cover as large a proportion of the population as possible with at least one dose of the vaccine um, on that premise that having some protection is better than having no protection at all. Yeah. 
Excellent. Um, my, my second question, maybe it's only an observation. Recently, we've seen um, an outbreak of respiratory illness in our high schools, am I correct? I, I find this very alarming because from, from where I sit, that vector is identical to what would happen with an outbreak of coronavirus here in Grenada. If a normal respiratory virus can spread, so would this. It's a very alarming sign to me. Um, is my perspective valid? It is very, very valid, and I, I tried to bring that across to the public when we did that press conference on, on Tuesday, is that this is another respiratory virus. And just like the COVID virus, it is spread in the same way. And the ease with which this virus was able to spread across the population is a signal, is an indication of what will happen if it were COVID-19. And that was the greater part of the concern, all right? Now, there are some basic measures that persons can take to avoid exposure, and that is wearing of the mask, the sanitizing, and the distancing. What this signaled to us, or what it indicated to us, is that a lot of these basic things are now being ignored, and we are giving room, we are making it easy for these types of viruses to spread. So it is a concerning sign for us because it means that we, you know, we, we have let down our guard and we have a lot of work to do to get back on track. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Edwin Frank, representing myself. Just two brief questions relative to what we've been talking about. Um, traditionally, we hear about expiry dates and best before dates. In terms of the virus, is there anything as best before date? Or is just expiry full stop? This one has an expiry date, not a best before. Not a best before. We, meant, we heard that the 17th, which is Monday, is the last day for the first vaccine. Is that still correct based on the fact that one is better than none? If people want to be vaccinated after the 17th, and it may mean just getting one, would that be addressed, so to speak? Would that be allowed? Yes, so I believe the, the, the date of the 17th is, for example, remember the manufacturer recommends yeah, from four, weeks. 4 to 12. So up to the 17th, um, you will be within the four weeks to get two shots. Okay. Um, after this, uh, you will get one shot and we would have to wait okay. for when ever vaccines become available in the future to get your second shot. Okay, I've asked the question because on the radio this week, it appeared as if if you didn't do it by the 17th, you're in problem. So you're basically saying that people can indeed be vaccinated with the first dose after the 17th. Yes, and we are encouraging everyone to come out and get vaccinated, even if it's your first shot, remember? Yeah. Some protection is better than none at, none at all. And finally, given the fact that we're you know, so close to the same 17th, are we planning, like here at the stadium, to have vaccination tomorrow, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and so forth? Because normally on weekends, they don't do it. I'm just wondering. Thank you. Right. We would love to have, <laughs> we would love to have vaccination um, sites set up every day, but we have a, a severe challenge as re, um, relating to staff. We simply do not have enough um, vaccinators to keep sites manned, uh, you know, for an extended for an extended period, and particularly on weekends. Hi, 
Thank you so very much, Dr. Charles. Now, um, we have a number of questions on the Zoom platform, and one of our team members are going to, um, to share them with us so that they can be answered. Um, a reminder for, to all our persons on Zoom to please raise your hands um, when you're ready to ask your questions so that we can make the platform available for you. Our all questions right. on Zoom. All right, good morning. Our first question is, Entry protocols for minors. Many of us want to travel home to Grenada. I myself am booked to come July 26th. I am fully vaccinated, so would only need to quarantine for two days. However, my daughter, who is 12, cannot be vaccinated as yet. But due to UK regulations, she has lateral flow tests every week. Why does traveling with a minor extend the quarantine from two days to seven? Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. If minors are not being PCR tested at during quarantine, why are they expected to extend quarantine for vaccinated parents that has no logical basis? Surely a, lot of, a lateral flow test should suffice after 48 hours. Third question, due to the need to quarantine, what provisions are being made for many of us who need to get to our homes in Karakou? When I arrive on Monday, as it stands, I would not be able to get to Karakou at the earliest Friday, dependent on what time I get released from quarantine. This is unfair. This is an unfair expectation and cost. Okay. Next question. Um, I think we will take those three questions first, okay. and then we will, um, we will continue with our are very important questions coming from our Zoom platform. Dr. Charles, um, unvaccinated travelers, um, minors. Right. What the, what persons need to understand is that um, this virus does not really discriminate. So minors can be infected and minors can bring the, bring the infection in. While the vaccinated person has protection, the minor doesn't. So that is the reason, that, 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 that is the reason for that policy. As long as you are traveling with someone in your party that cannot be vaccinated, no, right, that cannot be vaccinated, and the two of you are together, you're not um, separating, you will follow the, the, the um, protocol for an unvaccinated person. So you must have your PCR test done within 72 hours of traveling to Grenada. You will go into quarantine, mandatory for seven days. You tested a PCR test on the fifth day before you are released from quarantine. All right, simply because there's an unvaccinated person in the party. Now we make one exception, and that's for minors that are five years of age and under. All right, it is not. It is not that those five years and under um, cannot transmit the disease. All right, but we make that concession only for five years and under. So the reason for that policy is that, as I say, the, vac the, the virus does not discriminate. Even children can be infected and spread it. Thank you very much. There was also a question with regard to quarantine and karaoke. Well, I mean, the individual must consider for a moment. When you land in Grenada, you have to go on to karaoke. Now, we have made concessions for some individuals to quarantine in Karyaku. However, you cannot come with the expectation that you will get onto public transportation along with everyone else and travel to Karyaku. It is, it is an infection control um, thing. You come into quarantine, so we cannot allow you to take public transportation, which are, which are or public ferries, along with everyone and go to Karyaku. It's simply exposes locals to risk. However, if you are able to um, charter 
be it a flight or, or, or so, to get to Kariku for yourself only, um, that, that can be considered. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles. Um, we have some further questions coming in on our Zoom platform, so we will take them as well, all health-related. Um, we had Mr. Richard Strawn, who had his hand up. Um, Mr. Strawn, um, do you have a question? We can let you in to ask your question. Thank you. I just needed to know the opinion of the CMO on the CDC's latest position on uh, no mask for vaccinated persons, and is there any opportunity for a transfer locally? Right. So the CDC's position reflects the evidence that is becoming more, um, more apparent that following vaccination, um, persons are, in addition to being protected from, you know, um, disease and so on, persons are much less capable of spreading the disease. Now remember, every country or every public health agency makes decision based on their own context. And the CDC makes this recommendation based on the fact that a significant proportion of the U.S. population has already been vaccinated. All right. We cannot consider this as yet because we have far from that. We are far from the, the, the level of coverage that they have, um, that they have developed up there as a result of vaccination and also. So yes, in the not too distant future, we would love to um, come and make such an announcement. But until, until such time, uh, we still encourage persons to wear the mask. Now, one observation is that the recent um, outbreak of acute respiratory infection in Grenada um, should be a lesson to us that we are not wearing masks enough Right? We are not. And that's why the disease is able to spread from person to person. So maybe in the future, but not, not yet. Um, as we continue to feel. Yes, please, Dr. Very Minister. Mr. CMO, that I heard in the, you know, looking at CNN and so on. What they were saying is that because of the number and I, I you know you can you can comment on it if you so um, wish um, that the number of persons who have had COVID and have recovered it is is a significant amount and in addition to the number of persons vaccinated that the U.S. has a number of persons who would have contributed to getting towards herd immunity and so it makes it easier for them to do that than us who have about 5% uptake. The US percentage of uptake is much better than ours. So that puts them in a better position to because they have more persons vaccinated. And that is what I heard one of the experts say. So you may want to comment on that. This is, this is a fact because you can get immunity by two ways. Either by natural infection, you recover from the infection, you have some level of immunity, and by vaccination. When you put the two together, they are far ahead of us. So we are not there yet because we have not had a substantial um, outbreak of COVID here as yet, and our vaccination coverage is, is quite low. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Dr. Question. Charles. Um, anything further on that? No? Okay. Um, we also have, we have some questions online, um, but we will ask, and we have a question from our in-house audience. So, Mrs. Hood, would you please take the mic? Thank you. Well, 
following up on the, uh, the question about the mask, the fact that the U.S. has indicated the CDC yesterday that if you're fully vaccinated, there is no need to wear the mask inside or outdoors. What's about the visitors that are coming to the, uh, Grenada from the U.S. who may feel that they are not wearing their masks there when they come to Grenada? What is the recommendation to these persons? Thank you very much. Right. So our recommendation is that, is that they, they must wear a mask. Um, rem remember, the CDC is the public health agency for the United States and its dependencies. And the Ministry of Health is the public health agency for um, Grenada. So persons under our, our ju jurisdiction must follow um, the public health rules um, that apply to Grenada. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles. And just to inform our viewers and listeners that the Grenada Tourism Authority is getting ready to launch its tourism vaccination program, its campaign in support of the Ministry of Health's wider national campaign. And it's all about choosing Grenada, choosing to be informed. So thank you so very much for your questions today. We'll continue with questions now from our Zoom platform. We have Ms. Jane Lewis has her hands up. Ms. Lewis, we're going to let you in now. Okay. Actually, it's Elvis Lewis. Both my wife and I are sea glass plays. So I have a few comments and a couple questions. First, Dr. Charles, thank you very much for your presentation. Very well received. Um, I just wanted to point out, based on one of the things I think that the gentleman from Mystic Tours talked about, what getting out in the community and, and doing sort of like a, a political campaign um, outreach, and you said you've tried that. My recommendation is I think that is paramount right now because like your presentation to us as stakeholders, where we understand the value of the vaccination, I don't think the general population is really getting that message. I would recommend MOH, cabinet, the government, hire a PR firm and get a serious campaign out there so that Grenadians will understand the real value of the vaccination. That's my recommendation. Second question, on our first question, nurses that come to the facilities to do PCR testing, we've questioned a few of them, and we've had some repetitive nurses, so we know them, are not answering the question if they're vaccinated or not. And I find that a little odd that nurses come into establishments to do the testing are not vaccinated. I'd like to know what MOH is doing to address that. My first question, Second question, why is it that people who are fully vaccinated, verified two weeks after their final dosage, come into Grenada, has to get a PCR test, which is a requirement of our government, MOH, to enter Grenada, and then 72 hours still have to get another PTR, PCR test here, which they have to pay for? Cumulative cost just to enter Grenada seems extremely high when someone is already vaccinated. Why are we requiring that extra vaccinate and extra PCR test when they enter Grenada? It seems very odd. Um, it seems unnecessary. So I'm just trying to figure out what's the rationale and the, the idea behind that. So if you can just address those issues for me, I'm just curious as to how we're going to address that. We want to bring people here, and that just seems a little odd for that extra PCR test. Thank you very much. Dr. Charles. All right, so I'll address the first question. With regards, well, I mean, your comment about the campaign, your recommendation, I mean, I fully, I fully accept. I mean, I would accept any, any recommendation that would, you know, assist the Ministry of Health in, in you know, getting the message out to more people and, and having more persons vaccinated and, and protected. Um, with regards to um, the nurses um, stating whether they're vaccinated or not, um, now all frontline, remember, when we first started vaccinating, our targets were frontline workers, all right? So the Ministry of Health has um, provided vaccines, made vaccines available, recommended that all our frontline staff must be vaccinated. Uh, now, 
I'm not sure how this would come uh, or, or this may come across, but I'm I am not sure why it is important for the nurse to reveal to persons that they are there to to collect a sample from, whether they are vaccinated or not. I mean, they they're just they're just there to collect a sample and 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 leave. Um, remember, the decision to vaccinate or not is a personal one. All right, and it is our recommendation that all our staff be vaccinated. And it is not a policy that nurses must reveal whether they are vaccinated or not when they go to a site to collect, to collect um, a specimen. Thank you very much. As it relates to the second question. Go ahead, um, Doctor. Fully vaccinated persons, they have to have a pre-arrival PCR test 72 hours before travel and one on arrival. Now, vaccination provides a lot of benefits. However, a vaccinated person can still be exposed to the virus. They can still transmit the virus, right? So they can hold a virus. They may not get sick. They may be asymptomatic and they don't know that they have it. So this is now a risk assessment for us that the person entering is not infected or infectious on entry. Because remember, we still have to remember how COVID-19 works. A vaccinated person, they get exposed, let's say, during their travels, right? The incubation period for the virus is two to 14 days. So somebody who gets exposed, right? Let's say that virus show up within two days. We are able to capture that and isolate that person. Because remember, they, may, they will not get sick from becoming infected with COVID, or they may have mild illness, right? But they go out into the population, they can still transmit the virus. So that is a rationale for having a test on arrival. Thank you very much. Quick follow-up. So we just had a request from a guest who is fully vaccinated that's coming in on the basis of the 48 hour quarantine period. So on the website and filling out the travel requirements, there's nothing that asks where they can upload that information that they're fully vaccinated. So they asked us that question literally about five minutes ago. Is this something where they just present at the airport or what's the procedure there? Because the form online has not changed. All right, so the online form has been worked on, but a person arriving must present evidence upon arrival that they have been um, fully vaccinated to qualify for, to quarantine for, for example, the 48 hour period and so on. So the, the person must have a valid um, certificate of vaccination uh, here and present it to public health officials on arrival. So I'm, I'm not sure if I'm clear or if I'm understanding you correctly, because the or, or, or policy presently states it's a seven day quarantine period. So if the form is designed to reject anything less than seven days, where's the bypass where someone wants to just quarantine for 48 hours? I, I, it's just an HTML code and sort of I'm trying to figure out how, how is the site going to handle that? Are you going to reject someone if they're just doing 48 hours versus seven days because they don't have to get to Grenada first to show you that they're fully vaccinated. I leave it, bring me a cup of coffee, please, if you don't mind. I'm sorry to be bothering you so much. We are thankful if you can move your mic, please. We have some questions. Um, you want to answer, respond to Minister? I wanted to say something in regard to a question that was posed, I think, by the last caller, but earlier, okay. in terms of, he asked about the nurses who are not vaccinated, and um, the CMO said, well, you don't have to know. I, I am putting on my tourism hat here, and I believe that the Constitution allows owners, business people to protect the health of the workers and, and whoever comes into the place. And I know some businesses have been saying that to the staff that they need to be vaccinated to work on the premises. I know some business have been saying that if you do business with me and you have to deliver or anything, then your workers must be vaccinated. <clears throat> I, I think 
if that we have to have a level playing field for everybody. If, if you're saying that, I think the business has a right to know the status of anybody who comes into the compound. So um, I, I don't know how we're going to work it because up till now, government still has a policy that you, you can't force somebody to be vaccinated. And as Dr. Charles rightly said, it was first made because the ministry and government recognized the importance of getting frontliners vaccinated and the offer for the first few days, weeks, whatever, was towards the front line. And the uptake wasn't there, and so the focus shifted. <clears throat> now, this is, this is a question that we probably cannot answer here, but it is an issue because if you're saying that all your workers must be vaccinated, and if you're saying that the people you do business with, whomever they send must be vaccinated, then how do we say that other people can come and, 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 and do what they have to do unvaccinated, but others cannot come. It's a dilemma that we have to deal with in the business sector, not just tourism, but other sectors. And I don't want to put you on the spot, CMO. I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily want you to answer, but I, I don't want us to just leave it that way because that doesn't solve the problem, but it's something that will have to be brought to the table at a point in time. So I wanted to I wanted to add to the the last question that uh, that the gentleman asked. Now, the policy as it relates to persons who are fully vaccinated was implemented from the first of this month, and so far um, it has been working smoothly. So maybe um, some of the concerns he has aren't really concerns because they aren't really an, an issue right now. Now, if he is having a specific um, issue with, as it relates to one of his guests, then we can, uh, we can address it. But for the vast majority of everyone else, it has been, it has been working smoothly. Persons who, have, who are fully vaccinated, they come in, they, they are tested on arrival, they're quarantined for the time prescribed, which is um, around 48 hours, and they, and they are released. And, it, it, it has been working so far. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles. Mr. Garbutt, you wanted to do a make a response also with this question? I actually, um, I need to because um, when it comes down to um, us as employers, we have a heck of a responsibility. And our responsibility is not only to our employees, who fortunately has, meant, has been mentioned earlier, um, the hotel accommodation sector has done really very well when it comes to being vaccinated. And I'd like to congratulate all of our team members who have been, uh, who have been vaccinated. And one of the things that we are pushing is the fact that it's important to have health and safety at work now, when it comes to our properties, on our properties, all of our team members are vaccinated. When it comes to people delivering to us, we are stating that you cannot come onto our property to deliver anything unless you are fully vaccinated. So when it comes to hotels that are open, taxi drivers have got to be fully vaccinated tour operators have got to be fully vaccinated, people from Grenleck who come along to read the meters, people from uh, Nawasa who come along to read the meters, everybody needs to be vaccinated. So when it comes to people from the Ministry of Health, they need to be vaccinated as well. And it's very important for all of us in um, the society to make sure that we are talking to everyone to get fully vaccinated. And it's health and safety at work. We need to protect everybody at work. And the people who have been vaccinated are the people who will lead the economy. And we all need to get the economy going again. 
the only way we can get the economy going again is by this to be a safe destination. I also have to say that when it comes to our team members talking to uh, people who are non-vaxxers and they're talking about freedom, in actual fact it's the reverse. We can all remember in 2019 when we could go anywhere and do anything. At the end of 2019, we're all in jail. The non-vaxxers are saying, let's stay in jail. Actually, that's not a good plan. All of us need our freedom. We need to be able to do what we want to do. Can people remember going to church and sitting next to each other? Can people remember being in a choir? Can people remember going to restaurants and it being an easy joy? Can you remember going to um, parties and functions and there was no uh, areas of difficulty? You could go to the party, you could chat to anyone. Now we're in a state of emergency. As we're in a state of emergency, we have a curfew and the curfew was uh, pulled back. So all of the people who are listening to non-vaxxers, what they're saying to you is not about freedom, they're talking to you about staying in jail. So we in the hotel industry, we're talking about opening up as best we possibly can, and we're also talking about health and safety at work. So everybody who comes to any of our properties must be fully vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Garbutt. Um, Dr. Charles, um, the, our, health of, our health officials today will be leaving, with, uh, leaving in approximately five minutes. So I know you have your present very important health questions that you need to ask. So we will ask you to please be very brief with them. Um, I know we have some questions on Facebook right now. We've been taking most of the questions from the Zoom platform. So we will have um, our team member um, ask the uh, Go ahead I have with the a questions. question from Ms. Lynn Fletcher. She's asking, is the day of arrival included in the 48 hours for vaccinated travelers? Um, she further stated that hotels, etc., work on nights, and if a flight arrives at 6 p.m., this will be a three-night booking. So we're trying to verify if it is the day of arrival or the 48 hour kicks in from the following day? Right now, so the protocol sets up to 48 hours, right? So a person who is tested on arrival and the result is back in 24 hours, they will be released, right? So it's up to 48 hours and the day of arrival is included. Okay, thank you very much. You have a question? Sorry. We have reduced the quarantine period for vaccinated people for two days, but have not reduced quarantine time for those unvaccinated. Both groups can still carry it and transmit the virus, albeit at varying percentages based on some reports. I understand that we move from four days quarantine to seven days quarantine based on the incubation period for the virus. Is it that the incubation period for COVID-19 has changed based on your vaccination status? The incubation period remains the same, but the important thing that persons must understand is that there is benefits to vaccination. Now, one of those benefits, what our evidence has showed, is that vaccination reduces transmission up to 68%. And that is one of the premises for which we took that decision. So we know that vaccination reduces transmission, and that is the foundational premise for the decision. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any other questions on the Zoom platform or from our in-house audience? Yes, um, someone is asking, why can't the cost of testing be lowered to reflect our willingness to get the economy moving again? Dr. Charles, any um, response with regard to cost? Well, the unfortunate thing is that PCR testing is extremely expensive. The equipment is extremely expensive. The reagents are extremely expensive. Um, there are some things that 
you know the market just determines what it what, what it is and as you are aware i mean the government is not really making a lot of revenue because the level of activity that we had before is simply not there yet so you know it's a, it's basically an economic an economic um, um, issue all right it is an expensive test it's an ex and and um that is the associated cost. Well, um, thank you very much for your response. Hopefully long term, when we see those benefits rolling back in, we see that, they, that the cost is reduced and we become a little bit more competitive with our neighboring islands. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles. If no more questions, one more question. We'll take one more question and then we, um, we will bid farewell to the health team. So that we'll take two questions. We have one from, I believe, a taxi association in the, in the room, and we will take one more from our online platform. Samantha, you go ahead, and then we'll take the last question in-house. We have Ms. Diana Wright, who has her hands up. Ms. Wright, can you ask your Hello. question? The officer, I'm um, saying I'm okay saying about chartering to carry a coup. The only flights available are by Barbados. Gets in at 7.15 at night. We obviously cannot charter SVG at 7.15 at night. They do not operate after dark. So once we rented Grenada, we're going to get tested. Presumably then we're into 48 hours quarantine. I cannot see how telling me in November and March, it May that we can charter SVG helps. Can you help me? Do we need a bit more clarity on the quarantine question? Because what I understood initially, in order for maybe to answer the question, is that all of the quarantine, the first step on entry into Grenada would be for you to quarantine mm -hmm. in Grenada. Thereafter, you would go over to our sister isles. So maybe you may want to, um, uh, I don't think it was a matter of, um, you know, chartering a flight over to our sister islands, or maybe we that's need to have that question. I was told if I could charter of charter, then I said, well, if that's the only way to get there quickly, I would. But it, I can't see how it works because the flights are coming in in the evening and SVG only runs in the day. So. Um, well, thank you for your question. Anyone on the panel wishes to respond? I Please go um, ahead, Minister. I'll take a different angle, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> what, I, what I want to say is that um, flights are going in to, to Barbados and then persons have to come in. We, um, I, the project, I probably can correct me because sometimes it keeps shifting the expected time that Virgin and BA <coughs> had given to come into Grenada. If we can, and, and this caller might be talking about some time that is very close, but um, uh, one of the flights uh, was supposed to start in June, next month, 1st of June, mm -hmm. and the other in July. Um, the, the fact that we have gone from green to amber is a very vexing situation. Um, and it, it is based on our level of the uptake of, of, um, of the vaccine. And the fact that we've, we have far cry from the herd immunity that is so frequently spoken about. <clears throat> um, we would like all our passengers, all our, everyone, visitors, locals, everybody who travel to be able to come directly to Grenada, even if there's a stopover in, in another country. And I know GTA is, is working very assiduously, chairman and others, to see if they can, we can get one flight to come in, force into Grenada and all of that. But we have to understand that a lot of what happens depends on, and, and I know people are talking about governments have their agenda. My only agenda is to get our livelihoods back, to put bread and butter on people's table, to get Grenada back to 2019, and to go past that so we can get past our usual numbers. If that is an agenda, I am proud to associate with it. But the thing is, that a lot of these, the solutions, some of the solutions to this thing is getting vaccinated. We can't get past that. You know, it's not something you can ignore and then it will resolve itself because it probably will in time, but we may all be, be dead from something else. Stress, 
COVID itself, whatever. So um, I just want to say that I understand and I empathize, and we will do our best. We have been talking about ways we can alleviate the stress of, of, of the traveler, whether it's by looking at the reduction in the price, whether it's looking at other things. And as Dr. Um, the CMO said, Dr. Charles said, um, they have their own considerations, cost and everything, and, and to keep it viable. But I, I, I just wanted to put in my plug that we can make our choice, but other people are depending on us. Grenadians who live abroad, visitors who want to come here, Grenadians who live here and are unemployed, they are depending on us to make the right decision. So I just wanted to say that, and Dr. Charles will take his angle as he sees it. Um, the, the thing is, remember when I, when I spoke about, about quarantining in, in, in Kariaku? Remember what I said that the issue is, it's a logistic one. We cannot allow persons to land and take public transportation over to Kariaku. It has to be done in a safe manner. You're going into quarantine when you land. And the principle of quarantine is separation from the public so that you don't in the event that you are carrying a, a, a communicable disease, you don't you know, give it to others. So, I mean, that is basically the, 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 the premise. Um, we understand that, yes, there are some logistical challenges from getting from Grenada to carry a coup, but there are some things that, you know, are outside of our, our, um, out, out of our control, all right? But I do hope that persons understand the reason behind it, all right, is that we have to ensure that whatever is done is done in a safe manner. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles. We have our last question for the health segment from our in-house studio audience. Please uh, ask your question. Good morning, Jeffrey Cyrus from National Taxi Association. Uh, recently, I took two people to do the PCR test and we were closer to Grand Dance where they do tests down there. And he said to me, no, the country in which he's going would not accept this one. So I had to take him to St. Augustine. My question is, are we as a country have specific places that we take the tests from people who also come into Grenada? One. And Secondly, yes, we do our tests on the airport, but um, as we look into the cruise ship where the people will be coming for a couple of hours, what do we have in place for these people who just come in for uh, just a few hours and go back? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cyrus. The first um, question with regard to locations for testing. All right, so remember each country has a requirement. Right? Every country has a requirement. To travel to Grenada, you must have a PCR test. Right? I think the question, um, the comment is more, or the question is more about the type of test uh, really. All right, to come into Grenada, you must have a PCR test. There are different labs that do PCR tests, all right? PCR tests, very um, specific tests. It identify, you know, the genes of the virus and tells whether someone is positive or, or, or not, all right? There's another modality of testing, which are antigen tests, all right? Which simply look for some proteins or so that are, you know, present from the virus. What tests you do depends on your country's requirement. So the US will accept either a PCR or an antigen test. So persons may go to a lab where they can get the antigen test, or they may go to a lab where you get the PCR test. Now, PCR is available at St. Augustine's. It is available at General Hospital, all right? Oh, and also at SGU lab but that is um, a little more um, um, restricted. So these are the sites where you can get a PCR test in Grenada. There are other centers that do an antigen test, which is they swab the nose, they put it on a little, on a little card, like similar to uh, pregnancy tests, 
and a line comes up to say whether it's positive or negative. All right, the test that you choose to do will depend on the requirements of the country that you are going to. If you're traveling to Grenada, you must have a PCR, which is completely different technology. All right, some persons going to the U.S. may do that antigen test or the PCR test. So that's the difference. Thank you very much. Um, the question on cruise protocols. Any takers on the panel? With that one. We have been speaking to the cruise, um, cruise ship administration over the past weeks and months. And um, the, the agreement we have is that we designate a medical person from our side to communicate with a designated medical person from the cruise ship side. Um, our designated person is Dr. George Mitchell. I think most or everyone would know him. And also they have, they have designated someone from their side who are going to look into the details. What we have been advised by, and what they have been advised by the CDC is that all of the protocols have to be discussed with the destination where they're going and has to be approved and signed off before they attempt to go to any country. We are at this point now. Um, what, what, we, what we have agreed on is that the, the um, Adat Barbados will be doing the home porting where, of course, the, the clients, the guests, whatever, would fly in from wherever they, 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 they come from and the country of origin into Barbados. They will be tested and what have you. They must have their, their vaccine. They must be vaccinated and then they'll come on the, they'll start the cruise and they'll stop at different um, destinations. Um, they have proposed a frequency for testing on the ship as well after certain periods, whether it's two days or three days. But they're now finalizing on that. Cruise, cruise ships which, who have, have called back the seafarers, what they're doing now are simulation exercises. Training, simulations, everything is not finalized. I am not sure, and I stand corrected by the health persons, whether it would be absolutely necessary to test people when they come in, if they come in for a few hours, whether they can travel in a bubble, whether we will accept the testing from the cruise ship. These are some of the things that are being finalized at this time. So we may need to put a station there for testing. And if we do have, we will make the arrangement because I believe that it is important enough to give attention to things like that so that the economy can start really functioning. If it's not necessary, then we'll have to get the approval of the Ministry of, of, of um, Health and we'll have to agree on how we proceed. And so we'll have to work very closely with the two operators either and the the persons who operate the attraction sites. GTA and GHTA have been working on what they call approved attraction sites to ensure that those attraction sites where persons are going to be taken into, that persons are trained, that everything is there, and, and that they can, they can comply with what are the required protocols. So these are being fine-tuned. There's a general um, protocol that the cruise ship have shared with us we fine tuning that so we will let you know as soon as possible, certainly before the cruise ships actually start. Thank you very much, Minister. I think she's answered the question adequately. And on that note, um, I would like to thank um, Dr. Charles, the CMO, and Dr. Mariana Charles for being here with us today. Um, Dr. Charles, any parting words for everyone? Yeah, I. I hope that we were able to shed light on a lot of these, um, these issues with regards to vaccination, with regards to the benefits of vaccination. And um, I hope we were able to answer um, some of the doubts or the queries that persons have. But I really wish that persons understand the overall purpose, why we are bringing this message, all right? Because um, this is, this is what we need to do if we have to get back to normal. This is what we have to do in order to ensure that our population um, is protected.
to ensure that our well-being is, 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 um, is, is protected as well. Um, persons, um, you know, your, your overall health doesn't just depend on, you know, the absence or presence of a disease, but also all of the different factors that will affect you. And if you are unable to work and provide for your family, and if you are unable to move about freely, um, it will contribute to, to um, you know, poor health. So we just want to encourage everyone, all right, just, you know, work along with us, all right? We are doing this for everyone, not just for ourselves. All right, get vaccinated, obey the public health rules. Let us get out of this um, pandemic, you know, all of us, not some of us. All right, let us all get out of this pandemic together. Let us all work together um, and, you know, ensure that, you know, we are, we are all looked after. Um, thank you very much. Dr. Charles, I just want to throw in a little something here as, as you leave. Um, an interesting question was asked, um, would you consider doing sat Saturdays and Sundays? Um, you did say that your number, that the, 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 the staff, the available staff, they, they, they pressed at this time. Um, I would love to see us get to the point where there's such a demand that we have to do Saturday and Sunday so that we could achieve what you just said. Get over this thing, get past this so we can get our lives back. And um, there a lot of medical personnel who are not involved in this as yet. And, and I want to throw this as an appeal to persons to volunteer. Volunteer a couple hours. But of course the demand has to be there to ask stadium to open and to ask persons to come and then you get five or ten on a Saturday and a Sunday. Not that each person is not valuable. Each person is. But, you know, depending on the distance and the effort to come, you want to see numbers that make you feel a little better. Every number makes us feel good, but we can get better and better as the number increases. And so this is one, an appeal to health persons, professionals, to come out and join this fight. Some of you believe, a lot of you believe in the vaccine. Many of you may have taken it. To come out and help the Ministry of Health to deliver vaccines to others. But also, it depends on the uptake. So there's two sides of it. But if the need arises, I am sure Grenada would, Team Grenada would rise to the occasion and, and, and complement what the Ministry of Health are doing. They've done a marvelous job. I want to thank you, Dr. Charles, Dr. Both Charles by two, N not related as far as I know. And, um, you know, for, for making um, this time on, on such short notice, the demand last night, Dr. Mayana Charles was in St. Mark. And so somebody said that apart from what we do here to the converted, that we need to be going out in the communities, but they have been, they have started, and we, we, we plan to really energize that and get out to the public so that the, the authentic information can go out side by side with the misinformation so that people have a, a, can, a, a chance to make an informed decision. So we, we, we hope we can come to Saturday. I, I certainly hope we can do a Saturday and Sunday, but it has to, it depends on volunteers coming in and help and all of also people making it worth the while thank you very much minister it's all about working together and making this happen and the only way that we can actually do that is understanding that truly tourism does connect us all it is everybody's business and we all do have our part to play be that we do get out be that we've been medical professionals before find some way to be able to support the ministry of health thank you so very very much dr charles and dr charles As part of our program today, we have, we have on the agenda a presentation by, a sh short presentation by our, um, by a new company called Tether. And we also had a presentation for you to put things into context and for also for to be able to open the floor for other discussions in the tourism industry. So what we will do right now, Chairman, um, is that we will go through the presentation very quickly. Um, and then we will have um, Tether you know, um, tell us all about the app, the importance of the app, the importance for contactless and digital solutions. So we'll go straight into that. Are we ready?
In the meantime, do we have any questions on our Zoom or online platforms that are tourism, tourism related that we can ask, that we are, we are happy to ask while we're getting ready? Uh, Mr. Frank, you had a question for the panel? Do we have the time for, for the arriving plane from the UK as yet? Uh, Virgin and um, we mentioned dates vaguely, but we were speaking specifically about the time that the BA flight would arrive and the Virgin Atlantic flight. Do we have that information? Call. I was just wondering if we have the time, the scheduled time as yet. Um, actually, the scheduled time for BA um, originally was the 26th of May um, because of the uh, position that the UK government took last Friday, um, uh, being us in amber. What that has meant is that BA have put the schedule back and it's now about the 17th of June. Uh, it, so it's okay. mid-June. Mid okay. and, and they're talking about two flights a week. So in actual fact, that, that area, and, and one of the things that we all know about um, airlines and flights, is that the schedule can change. Um, so that's the um, specifics at the moment, but it is subject to change. Okay. And Virgin have always been talking about coming in July. Okay, thank you. But, and do we know the actual time in the day? <laughs> no. Um, in actual fact, that changes as well, but invariably what they uh, try and do is to leave at a reasonable time in the morning in the UK, okay. um, which is about 10 o'clock, and arriving here 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. Finally, um, we spoke of moving from green to amber. So we were green? I didn't realize they were green. Were we green? Yes, we were. We were. I, actually, I, actually... I've, I, I can answer that one because yeah. what, what we were, there was no amber, green and red before last Friday, okay. but we were considered a safe destination because okay. of the fact that we'd had so few numbers so, uh, of, of COVID cases. Uh, 160 to our population is very, very low. Okay. When it comes to our neighbours, our neighbours uh, are very, very high. So actually that's been one of our difficulties that we all know is that a lot of our friends, a lot of our people do talk about the fact there's no COVID here. But in Barbados, the people are standing in line. A friend of mine stood in line from nine o'clock in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon to get his first dose. To get his second dose, he was standing in line in the sun um, from nine o'clock in the morning till two o'clock in the afternoon. So they're very serious about what they're doing. They want to get their um, uh, country back and they want to be in the green zone. We need to be in the green zone. We've got a fantastic tick in the box when it comes to our COVID-19 cases. It's very, very low. With the, the X that we've got is the low take up of um, our population um, uh, to, to take the vaccine. And actually, I, I said earlier, uh, one of the things is that it strikes me as very strange is that we all need to uh, lead a better life. We don't need to be in jail. We need to get out of jail. So come on, we all, everybody in the, the whole population, let's get vaccinated. And then there's a, there's a phrase that we can use. Look, if you want a jab, jab, get the jab, jab. Yeah. And if I may say finally, there was an article yesterday which spoke of Grenada getting to green on the 17th. It was speculative, but seemingly confident that it will happen yesterday. Actually, that's in the media. Um, so we all know that the media can drag us along and sometimes drag us along in the right direction, sometimes drag us along in the wrong direction. When it was coming to um, the position last Friday, um, I was very keen to uh, uh, see the news and I watched um, uh, the people from the UK giving their announcements 
and the announcements of the green countries uh, were really disappointing. I, I was pretty sure Grenada was going to be in that. Um, the media in the UK thought that Grenada would be in the, in the green list, but um, disappointingly we weren't there. We were talked about in very good terms because we, we have got a fantastic reputation to look after our population. And we've done that and we've got to thank our Ministry of Health, we've got to thank our government for leading us to a situation that we are one of the best countries in the Caribbean when it comes to vaccinations. When it comes to what we all know, we're the best country in the Caribbean to live in. What a lot of um, tourists know, that this is a very safe destination and we can make it safer and safer and safer by getting vaccinated. And then when it, when it comes to a point, so imagine a position whereby we've got a tourist who arrives, they're fully vaccinated and they come out of the airport and they go to a taxi and they say to the taxi driver, are you vaccinated? And the taxi driver says, no, he said, well, I'll, actually I'll get another one. So, you know, it's, it's that sort of decisions that everybody makes. And I'll tell you, I would do the same thing. And that lots of other people do the same thing as well. So if you don't think that um, getting vaccinated is, is your responsibility, in the um, invocation, we were told, thank you very much for that, that we need to take personal responsibility. Actually, we need to take personal responsibility for our own health and for our family's health. And not only our family's health, our colleagues' health. And then if you're a, a, anything to do with tourism, you mix with people. You need to make sure that you're fully vaccinated and that you do not pass on the, um, the, the, the virus to anyone at all. Thank you very much. Um, we were making a slight adjustment to our program. What we will do is that we'll have the floor continue to be open for any um, co comments, suggestions, um, inspiring thoughts, um, and of course for questions as well. Uh, do we have anything on the online platform? We have nothing on the online platform, so I will share as you consider your questions. Um, so I will share with you that from the regional leaders, um, for those of you, we have a question, please. We have a Mr. Bernard jo John who has his hands up. Mr. John, you can ask your question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll get in on the program later because they said over 100 participants. I was on there and I couldn't get in, but I get very but So I missed some of what was. You the end in what I heard is the same thing that is occurred. I mean, speech all about and regionality. My question is Grenada had 162 active cases, right? Now, according to the statement, Grenada has zero. COVID right now. My question is at one death, so we end up at 161. My question is, all these people was treated here in Grenada and became COVID free. Without vaccine, without, without, you know, so then the, the ministry or the doctors, they did something that the world don't know about. Because most of the countries are, are especially calling for oxygen and ventilators. And we, we people, these people was treated and they was COVID free after that, that period. The next question is, is that vaccine approved by the FDA? That's my question. Thank you very much, Carla. Um, anybody on the panel wishes to answer um, this question, but with re as it relates to the question on the, the vaccine, as Dr. Charles would have indicated before, um, 
the, 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 it has been approved by all relevant agencies, health agencies um, th in, uh, on the international level. Minister, would you like to um, respond to uh, that question? Really no, well, just, Maxine, just if you can. It, it, it's unfortunate that the, the question is coming a little late. Um, what I do know is that WHO, in collaboration with the major agencies or uh, the major bodies who deal with um, approving vaccines, have approved um, the AstraZeneca vaccine as well as a few others. And um, well, I'm not I'm not sure if FDA is in on this, but certainly WHO. So this is a question we can, we can verify. WHO, CDC has approved. Government has a, 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 a rule that we would not use any vaccine that has not been approved by WHO. And so we're guided by them, and they are guided by other agencies as well who certify vaccine or who approve vaccines. So in terms of the breakdown as to which are the agencies, I am not sure and I wouldn't want to, to um, say yay or nay. But we have that policy that it has to be WHO approved and we're guided by them. Thank you very much, Minister. I think that hopefully it answers your questions and clears up any concerns that you may have had, um, caller. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions that, um, other tourism related questions? Please, we have in-house. Uh, please, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, Pleasant, good morning. Thank you very much. I, um, Reverend Harold Andrews is now leaving us, so thank you so very much for being with us today. Welcome. Sheldon Noel, representing Royalty Taxi and Tours. Um, this is a cruise ship related question. Um, what are the protocols? Or what's the government and the cruise ship stand yeah, when it comes to their guests arriving to Grenada and booking a private tour with a certified and vaccinated operator or a company? What's the, the policies or protocols on that? Um, if I may take a stab at that, um, Minister. Um, all of the cruise ships coming to Grenada um, at this point, which would, of course, we'll start with Seaborne in July, um, they will be looking at pre-packaged tours primarily. However, if it means that an arrangement has been made prior um, to provide that private um, tour, uh, I'm sure that is going to go ahead without, without a problem. Now, the thing that we must remember is that, that in order for you to be able to provide a, a service um, or a product in Grenada right now, um, you must have your pure safe travel certification. That means you have to have your, your certificate of training from the Ministry of Health um, as part of the whole COVID safety um, agenda. Um, and then, of course, at the end of the day, like you indicated, of course, you're vaccinated. You need to be vaccinated in order to do that. So it is important that, um, you know, that any service provider has that certification. And of course, with, really, with regard to um, the tours, those things must be pre-approved before, before getting on island. So independent tours would maybe a little bit more tricky. Uh, do we have any other questions online? Okay, we have no questions online right now. So what I will do is I will share with you, um, for those of you who may have missed the as best as I could. Um, our Minister for Tourism is getting ready to leave. Minister, would you like to um, say a few words before you depart? Um, just to say that, first thing comes to my head, we're all in this together. Um, and the solution has to come from all of us. And, and, and there has to be commitment and, and, and true compliance on the behalf of everyone. Um, I want to compliment the chairman and the team of GTA. And G GHTA, we couldn't do without you. Um, Mr. Garbot, CEO, we've, we've all been working together behind the scenes. But I, I, I asked for this meeting and I insisted on it because I think 
others need to know what we're doing and we've been a little bit too silent, but we have not been um, idle. We have been having meetings with the airlines, with the cruise ships, with just about everybody. And I think we, we need to make this a little more often than we've had it. It might be just a one hour session, but just to ensure that everyone is clear on what we're doing and that we're guided by you as well to how we can work best with you. Um, so this is where we are. Um, as a matter of fact, as I leave here, I'm going to assist in, in, in the nurses in an area to vaccinate some persons. I had that commitment before, so I, I have to do that. But um, on the government side, we're all doing our part. Um, we're all extending longer hours. And um, I don't know how chairman does it. He's in every forum, every meeting. Um, and a number of good things have really happened in our country. So this is not a doom and gloom situation. It's just that we've gotten to a juncture where we have to make some serious decisions, whether we're going to go forward or whether we're going to limp along and hope. We have to live in hope, but you can't sit down and hope. We have to do things. And um, the work with the vaccines, the work with the protocols, I mean, I'm very impressed with the questions, the level of questions that were answered, um, because we're here to hear concerns. And if we haven't thought through any issue, some of the issues raised would have stimulated. Later on, I, I, I always attend um, the meeting with the COVID team and I raise the issues. And I'm sure um, Dr. Doctors, um, Charles, two Dr. Charles who have been here, will, we will have an opportunity to regurgitate what would have transpired today and revisit some of the issues because this is not a perfect thing. This is something that we develop as we go along because COVID is still, after one year and a half, thereabouts, still new to us because it's changing so dynamically on us. It has us on our toes. So um, we are going to continue what we're doing and um, you know we are open to um, suggestions, recommendations, and we want to work even more closely with everyone. Thank you. There is a hand up. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Minister is um, getting ready to leave us now, but I see we have a, a question. Is that a question for Minister? Well, I want to ask a question before she leaves. You want to ask a question before she leaves. Minister, could you please indulge? Okay, very well. Please, you can take the microphone. <coughs> they are working, I don't want to say it, but they are working on some stimulus packages. Eh? Even for persons who when have got it before. So that should come soon. Last <coughs> seminar, we got a sticker on our mm. windscreen indicating that we are qualified to do this more uh, COVID thing. Mm -hmm. Many of us in our association did that. In fact, all of us in our association did that. However, even up to today, if my mother come on the airport, I am debarred from picking her up. My mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. well, I have to ask the question mm -hmm. directly to the minister. Mm -hmm. Why are we who qualify, have our certificate, have our, all our equipment in our vehicles and all these things, for that purpose, why is it that we cannot go to the airport and pick up or a nenen, so to speak. You know, I, I, have, uh, I have on behalf of uh, my association, we have complete difficulties with that. Mm -hmm. One. And two, as we talk about the ship coming, and it seems likely the course I'm hearing is that how we work, we work with the loose passengers. And it seems as though that is going to be in a dark spot for us. Although we're going to, you are, we are being encouraged now to take our vaccine, we have done the course and all these things. But it seems very likely that this would be our association part going to be in a dark spot because we may not have that loose passengers to deal with. I would like to know how, as an association, you prepared for us to survive in that area. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, sir. I, I must 
say that the, um, the taxi association, associations have been pretty cooperative with us and pretty compliant. I hear your two concerns. I, I must confess we haven't really had some, we, although we've had discussions on other taxis being able to go to the airport, um, I don't think we've really fully thought it through. And I'm happy that you've raised it because I am aware that there is some disparity. There, there was before, it wasn't a disparity. It was just uh, a division of provision of the service. Um, some were more for the crew, some were more for that. But I realized that there are, these are difficult times and we have not communicated enough on that. So on this two weeks, and these are evolving issues and that's why sessions like that are important. What, since this is a taxi issue, and I don't have a ready answer, let me give you a short um, answer which comes as a recommendation. That as a follow-up to this, let's have a meeting, let's have a meeting and discuss that, how it can work, because we, we don't want to be unfair, but we don't want chaos either, so that airport taxis are waiting there, and then other people just come in and take everybody, and, and, and there's no order to it. I know they have a dispatcher, so I'm sure something can work out through the dispatcher because um, everybody who takes a taxi is, is allocated by a dispatcher. And since we have that, that system in place, I do not envisage that it would be very difficult, but I do not want to give an answer without having a full discussion on it. So can we do that as a follow-up with, with the taxi association or associations to... Um, discuss that further. I don't have a ready answer for that one. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, thank you for being with us today. Um, we, are, we should be wrapped up in the next five to ten minutes um, as we signal our, our closing of the program. Now, um, we are going to be, we, we have on standby Tedda, uh, Mr. Chad Fraser, who is going to be sharing with us the, his new app. And what I would like to do is to, to let you know that this is really very important for us. Contact lights and, and being digital. Um, being able to support um, the tourism services and businesses on the ground and utilizing the, the technology to do so. Um, just on Tuesday at the high end UNDP Regional Dialogue, um, our Prime Minister as well as the Prime Minister of Dominica was talking about the importance of integrating contactless and digital services. Um, and of course, not only that, but with regard to the ECCB um, passport that we have now in terms of the decash system that is currently available. So we do need to be able to, to move forward in that direction. Our evolving visitor expects contactless and digital solutions, and we need to get to the next step. So um, Mr. Fraser is going to do a very, very um, short presentation for us on the Terra app. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so I, I would be very short. I would use, um, can, can everyone see the screen now? Huh? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, good. Yeah, so what is Tedda? Um, let me just give you a brief history. Tedda is a solution that was built for help in the tourism sector. Um, it, it was built in collaboration with the Ministry of Tourism and the GTA along with trade and, other, and, and a couple other ministries. But the idea is to provide a safe solution so that um, uh, to facilitate the reopening and, and the safe um, operation of, of our vendors and, and tourism um, stakeholders. So it, it's, a, it's a mobile app, right? Um, and it does a couple things. The first thing that it does it, pro it, it provides, uh, uh, I would say, a, a replacement for the sign-in books and so forth that you would have, a safe replacement, all right? Um, and I'll show you how that works. The second thing it does is that it gives um, the vendors and any, any, any business the ability to, to, to build a community. Now, we know physical contact with customers, with, with um, people who may visit our premise, is, um, is very limited and is not encouraged, right? So what it would do is give you an online platform for engaging those visitors who come to your business. And finally, um, especially for people who have products or, or service, um, or so products selling, 
Um, it gives you a full online platform, a full e-commerce platform for selling um, your goods uh, um, and so forth. So I'll show you how each component of it works. All right, I'll start with the QR, the, um, the, the contactless sign-in or check-in as we call it, all right? Um, now, the users need to download the app first. Um, we've been promoting it online um, in partnership with GTA, and we'll continue to, to build and promote it a lot more so that the visitors are aware of it before they arrive and, and, and up on arrival, all right? So how it works, you go into the app, you register your business. It's free to register your business in Teda. You register yourself first, and then you register your business. And you get a code, a QR code, we call it. Um, let me show you what a QR code would look like. Um, let me just pull up my camera. So this is a QR code, right? It, it's, and I know you probably see them um, in different places. So you get one of these to download um, and print. And you would have it up at your location. So if it's a boot you have, or if you're a taxi driver, you have it in your taxi. Um, or if you, you know, at your door, at your entrance to your premise, you have it um, there. So a, a visitor comes, they have the app, they register once in the app, right? Preferably before getting to your premise. So once they're there, they open the app and they click on this blue button right here, right? Click on the blue button and the scan, they put in your temperature and you see check-in. And that's how quick the check-in process is. All right, so you could imagine that replacing someone being there to sign a book and sign in and whatnot. You click scan, it takes less, literally less than five seconds to check in, key in your temperature and, and, and get out of there without touching a pen, um, without using the notebooks and so forth. It's safe, it's contactless, and, and most importantly, it's convenient for the users. Now, in a, once a user checks in, right, they have the ability to follow you. This is very, very, very handy. What it does, it gives you the ability to re-engage that customer um, after they leave your premise. So when someone I click follow, all right, and once someone follows you, you can now post content to them. So let me show you what I would see as I'm following some businesses. So you have the feature, today's feature, and you could have your business being featured for a particular day in the app. So once people go on, the visitors come, they download the app, they can see your business there. They can see your business featured for the week. And below is where we have our, our I would like to call it an online mall or shopping center, all right? Where you could see all the different products from all the different um, providers, all right? So you see uh, makeup, you see art, we have a, a broad art collection on our platform now. So visitors could go on there and buy art, they could go and buy the spices, they could buy plants, and different categories of products. And below, I can see posts um, that's submitted by different people. So you see aquarium, aquarium restaurant, just posted their, um, one of their, their promotion, a line they have, and you could go down and see products um, from different people who are, um, who, are, who are on the platform. So these people, I'm receiving those updates from them because I have followed their business, all right? So now um, they have this new platform to re-engage people who once visited them, all right? Then you have um, the, the feed, so that's my full feed, and as well, I can go to a directory. So even if you don't have um, um, products and so forth selling, you can just put your business on there so someone could go in, they could look up your business, they could look for a particular category of business, and, and you could be listed there. Once you're listed, I'll just go to one of these, these um, I'll choose a tourism provider. <laughs> Let's choose uh, Macabana. All right, and once I choose here, you see you have the ability to put, to brand it. So you can see my profile, the profile picture, you see the, um, the logo, you can also get description, as well as direction, um, on the map, contact details, so that someone could just click and call you, and so forth. All right. Um, the e-commerce part of the platform is 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 well developed as well. So I just look for another business um, who I know has this, um, set up the products. Um, so I just look for Old Bush, and this is a, a small business. They they sell plants. 
um, recycled um, in recycled pots. So you see these, these pots are, are, are actually, most of them are tin cans and bottles that are recycled and, and decorated and so forth. Um, so if you look here, you see some of the items that are in the directory. And now you can go to the shop, to shopping, and see an entire online store that, that they have with all the different plans and products that, that they, they want to sell on the platform. Now, um, so, so that covers the e-commerce part of it. You could go in and give details. What we also offer in, in here is a full web store as well. So in addition to persons being able to buy from you on the, on the app, they can also buy and support your business on the web. And we now have a mechanism to be able to collect payments and so forth. For the restaurant providers, we have uh, the ability for you to also put your menu in that same way and be able to take in-house orders um, for persons who are dining in. So I could stay at home, order some food um, in umbrellas, for example, um, once they're on there and, and have and have um, be able to to, um, to collect it once it, once you, whatever your business you have if you go on there to put your products on there and be able to um to, but the idea is to encourage every stakeholder to populate the profile it doesn't cost you anything um to to go on and 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 add your business brand it um, and in terms of safety we 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 that was one of the key considerations as we design the the um the, the platform. Um, all the data, the user data is secure um, on, on the device, we do, we do encrypt it, and um, only you as a business owner has um, access to, to your data. Um, so if the Ministry of Health, for example, asks you for a list of persons who visited you, you can go into there, you can download that list for the, 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 the dates that they asked for and um, supply it to them. But it's it's very closed, um, and we we um, we try to 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 ensure that the user safety is is is, is um, taken into consideration. Perfect. And that's a, a brief walkthrough, and um, thank you for for having me. And if you if you'd like to to learn more about Tether, um, or or the company Sonova, you can go to Tether.gd. Um, or just go to any of the app stores and download the app. You can help you set up a profile and provide whatever support you need in getting started. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much, Chad. I'm sure um, you'd have a lot of people, you know, um, definitely taking a look at the app and do considering um, loading it up and getting ready to do business contactless business business right as they say we have one before we close and we, we do all the final thoughts and the closing remarks we have a question from crystal cooper on zoom so we'll take her question as our last question and then um mr garbert is going to give his final thoughts today followed by our chairman the chairman of the grenada tourism authority hello can you hear me yes we can um, okay, I just um, remembered a question that wasn't really um, talked about. We have a small charter business that operates based out of Grenada. So the ship carries um, 15 people that would go for one week cruises. And my question is, they would go through the protocol, people would fly in, go through the protocol at the airport and quarantine how necessary. But once they leave the country then, is there a way for getting them back into the country? They'll have to do the other uh, 48 hour quarantine again because the ship needs to turn around for the next day um, for a new group. We haven't started, but we are looking at uh, requiring people to be vaccinated, um, crew and, and passengers. Uh, so this is something that we're looking at toward opening up business again. Right. Thank you very much for your question, Carla. Um, with regard to charters, and if it means that when you're talking about um, returning, um, I am on. The, well, it's my understanding from what you've said that it's it's a charter, maybe from um, Grenada that goes up to Carrier Coup and back, or are you going further afield? Because if you no, go further no. afield. 
excuse me, we do one week, we could go to uh, the Grenadines, that's St. Vincent. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes we go to St. Lucia and back in usually a week. Okay, in that case, once you're going into another jurisdiction, once you get there, there's going to be protocols that would apply. So when you get back to Grenada, um, once you've gone to any, other, any of the other islands, you will be subject to quarantine um, protocols as per Grenada right now for any visiting yachts. So with that being said, I think we have signaled our closing wrapping up for today. Um, I would like to invite Mr. Garbert, who is going to give us some final thoughts for today. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, um, when it comes down to it, um, all of us in Grenada have suffered several things. 9-11 um, was a, a big blow to our tourism and blow to our country. And then we had Ivan, um, and then we've had the financial crisis. One of the things that um, we've got in Grenada is we're a very res resilient people. And actually, we'll get out of this. Uh, we're in a, a difficult situation. Um, so it's as if we're in a shipwreck and um, we're all in the sea. Some of us see a lifeboat coming towards us and we're happy to get on that lifeboat. Strangely, some of us see a lifeboat coming towards us and say, I'll wait for the next one. So actually, Let's all get on the lifeboat, because when we all get on the lifeboat, we all get vaccinated, we're in a very optimistic situation. We can come out of this, and we can come out of this stronger and better, and we will. So all of us uh, together, we all know that one hand can't clap, but together we can m make a real noise, a big applause. So uh, anyway, thank you very much, Chairman, for inviting me, Madam Chair. Um, and Arlene and I are grateful for, for this situation. I also must compliment the Chairman on helping um, us in the accommodation sector when it comes to uh, the uh, position with Cornell. It's a fantastic situation for us to be able to be um, involved with training via Cornell and via, via the West Indian School of Hospitality. I think we're very lucky in Grenada. And actually all of us know that we're lucky in Grenada to, to be here. So let's push our luck and push our luck in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Garlett. I invite uh, Mr. Collymore to make his closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, let me just start by saying how pleased I am with the participation here today um, in the forum. I think that um, this is something I was, <coughs> Minister was just telling me before uh, she left that she thinks we need to do this more often. And um, what I think that we will do is we'll do it um, every four to six weeks or so, and, um, but we'll do it on different um, aspects of tourism so that um, this was more of a general forum um, but for instance I think one of the things that we need to address quite urgently is um, the UK market so uh, what I would endeavor to do is to have um, different types of panelists um, and uh, seek the minister's guidance and I, I think probably we should have a UK forum uh, UK Grenada forum um, as, the, as the next one to see how we deal um, with the UK market. Uh, it's important for us to, to stay connected with all of our stakeholders. Um, as Leo says, we're all in this together. And, and like Leo, I feel very positive um, about the future. And, uh, and I feel very optimistic that we can uh, turn things around. There are some very good signs uh, for Grenada that uh, things are changing. We have uh, two, is it two or three of the largest yacht races in the world coming here, Curl, at the end of the three, three of the world's largest yacht races uh, come into Grenada for the first time at the, uh, at the all together um, at the end of the year. 
we have now been confirmed for um, West Indies versus South Africa cricket um, next month. And and again, I, you know, there's no uh, there's no definite on whether or not there will be in person attendance, but I am sure that. And I personally will make the case that uh, if you are vaccinated, um, I don't see any reason why you couldn't go to watch the cricket. Um, it's not my say, it's not my call, but I see nothing wrong with vaccinated people watching the cricket. It may or may not be possible, but this just demonstrates um, the type of time that we are in now where a vaccine is not just a matter of um, taking a shot it's a matter of um, you being able to have a certain level of freedom uh, that the unvaccinated person may not have. And, and, um, and, and, and that's just the way it is because uh, no one wants uh, to be at risk or no one wants to, uh, others to put them at risk. So the vaccine uh, is one of the things that we can do to ensure that, that we don't put others at risk and, and put ourselves at risk. Um, we also have uh, been working um, quite hard on the Grenada's uh, international uh, marketing. Um, we have new marketing teams in the in the UK and appointing new ones in the United States. Uh, we have some very very lofty goals. Uh, we believe that we can um, see um, tourism increase coming out of the pandemic. Uh, because we believe that Grenada is seen as a safe destination. We believe that Grenada will be on the type of list that it had, has never been on before, where people will look for the safest destinations first, and Grenada uh, can be listed as one of the safest. And this is why we are seeing uh, uh, all of, uh, there's so much interest in, in uh, what is happening here. And, and interest with, uh, with our airline partners and, and tour operators um, and so on. Um, I also want to make the point um, as an as a add-on to, to what uh, was presented earlier by the gentleman from TIDA. Um, and I'd like to um, challenge persons in the wider community in general. Uh, tourism is not just about um, a guest coming to Grenada and staying in a hotel and, um, and going on the beach and having fun. There are a number of businesses that have emerged out of tourism and, um, and tourism is really the, I call it the Caribbean's greatest export because we are um, exporting um, our way of life but instead of sending it overseas we invite people here to experience it and, and thereby we get um, foreign exchange and so on. So I want to encourage especially young, young persons who have good ideas, um, like the gentleman with the TIDA app, to see that there are many linkages that can um, be established through tourism. And uh, we should be able to create not just a, um, a, a, a traditional workforce, tourism workforce, but we should be able to create a, a a workforce that is um, that supports the tourism industry, so we do not have to um, to depend on imported services to um, um, to survive, but we can create uh, our own here. Um, and then, finally, to 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 end, I just want to. Um, thank again um, the Ministry of Tourism um, for organizing, the Minister's Drive for organizing this, our partnership, strong partnership um, with the Grenada Hotel and Tourism Association. We will continue to, uh, to work closely together and, um, and I promise you that we will, um, we will do this. We, it will be, m this, this, this was a more general one, but uh, we will have specific topics of interest related to the, the different sectors. There's a lot of questions about different sectors, the dive sector and the environmental sector and um, persons who um, 
the business sector, the, all of the businesses surrounding environmental tourism, all of those things are things that we need to stay in dialogue with. We've got some good ideas out of today, and I think that uh, that we um, can take um, a lot of them to heart and uh, go back and, and, and answer them and, and uh, create uh, better solutions for our industry. Um, so, I mean, that's it for me, Curl. Um, did I cover everything? Is that? <laughs> You so, certainly did, Chairman. Um, right. I think it just leaves me now to, to thank the thank viewers, um, to thank our listeners for today, to thank our in-house audience who were specially invited, and of course our minister who was our he the head of the panelists for today, um, to thank her, to, ha to thank um, Reverend, Reverend Andrews who definitely definitely you know, set the stage for us this morning, and of course to the president. Uh, sorry, I want to say one more thing. He wants to say one more thing. Sorry. Um, go ahead, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I, every time I go to a restaurant, um, to any kind of tourism facility, my mind is always um, with the workers. Um, we all, the, the doctors and nurses and police officers and so on on the front line have been doing a remarkable job and, and have been recognized. But I do not know if we have paid enough attention to um, the, the persons on the tourism front line, many of who are continue to work um, at uh, significantly reduced salaries. Um, they continue to give good quality service, um, and they and and the reason why they are are um, doing that is because they have a passion and they believe that we will. Uh, that there's light at the end of the tunnel. So I just wanted to, to I forgot to do that in my um, opening remarks because I, I really wanted not to be lengthy and to get as many questions in um, as possible. But our tourism workers have been on the front lines themselves working hard um, for a fraction of what they would normally earn, but they have a passion and a love and, and we really need to recognize them. I also want to recognize as well the business owners, entrepreneurs in the tourism industry who continue to innovate, to find new ways of uh, keeping their businesses open, who stay up late at night uh, trying to design new strategies and, and so on in order to, to, to just for survival. I think I say to them that, uh, that there's light at the end of the tunnel. We are extremely focused and extremely optimistic on um, in getting things back. Sorry, it's, it's, someone has a question? Was that a question? Okay, because after I'm finished, I'm done. So, <laughs> Bro, ask your question now. This is a concern. Um, why, this, why the CEO job was not offered to Mr. Asiali? That's, that's a good question, and, and I wondered why she didn't apply as well. I think that the chairman has answered the question. In no, um, guys, this CEO um, position is, has caused a lot of, um, it's, it, is, it, it has um, caused a lot of debate, and um, what you, what, with every job, um, the, 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 and Leo was a part of, so, so he's to blame as well, not just me. <laughs> but we had, a, we had a set number of applications, and you can only employ persons who apply um, for a job. Um, but, but what I want to assure everyone here is that um, we are not just thinking about today. We are thinking about tomorrow. And we are, um, are you listening? My brother, are you listening? Right. Because somebody was distracting you. So I was <laughs> no, I, it's, it's a serious thing. We are not just thinking about today. We are thinking about tomorrow. And um, within the, 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 the GTA and, and tourism in general, we are setting up a system. It has never been done before. In spite of all the criticism, this has not been done before. But we, we're going to do it. We're doing it in partnership with GHDA and so on. We're, um, we have learning and, and mentorship paths for um, young executives to reach the top. 
and the West Indies School of Hospitality is, is one of the ways in which uh, we intend to do that. Um, Cornell University, as you know, is one of, of the most prestigious, probably the most prestigious university, hospitality university in the world. Um, the courses are not cheap, extremely expensive. Um, but we have found support to underwrite these courses so that everyone in the hotel sector can get trained uh, at all levels, including senior management levels. We intend to come out of this with a better trained workforce, um, and I bet you that the next time that we um, open up that um, uh, application again for um, the, the top positions, um, in fact, we have... Uh, a couple more top positions to fill in, fill in the um, GTA, which we see some very good application from um, Grenadian candidates. But um, our aim was to was to select the best of the persons who who had applied, and and I think that's what we did. But I will bet you that with what we are doing with um, capacity building within the GTA, that we will come out of this uh, with a better trained um, workforce. Um, and and uh, persons would would uh, would add to their skills, and uh, it will be for the benefit of, of of everyone. Our aim was just simply to choose the best candidate, and 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 we think that we did, and um, and we are already seeing some benefits uh, from that. All right, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, as I was indicating, thank you so very much to all of you for for being with us today, for viewing and for staying with us for the last two and three quarter hours. We do appreciate your time, um, and I'm sure it was time well spent. Just some final thoughts. Don't forget, tourism connects us all. Let us work together, but smarter. Choose to be informed, and finally, let's support the COVID-19 efforts. So thank you for joining us, and of course, we look forward to having another session like this in the future. Thank you so very much. Grenada safe. Be COVID-19 smart.